Hi, everyone. Welcome to the LSESU Developing Market Society's seventh and final event of the year, which is the myth of private equity. And we're co-hosting with UCL Economics and Finance Society, KCL Economics and Finance Society, and Imperial Investment Society. Jeff Hook, professor at John Hopkins University, will be exploring the myths that permeate the world of private equity. And our moderator will speak a little bit more about him in a minute. Our moderator will be LSE research and teaching assistant, Bo Tang, whose research primarily focuses on the governance of blockchain and blockchain-based corporate finance, as well as cryptocurrency and private equity and a smattering of other fields. So without further delay, I'll pass this over to Bo Tang to introduce the speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, today we're very honored to have Jeff Hook here. Jeff is a current professor of finance at John Hopkins University's uh, Cary Business School with over 40 years of experience within, around, and across the world of mergers and acquisitions. Starting off as an investment banker at Lehman, Le Lehman Brothers to authoring four best-selling books on the topic. Uh, perhaps his most notable bestseller is the classic uh, security analysis and business valuation on Wall Street. But he's gained more popular acclaim in recent years, following a fascinating talk and Google on the very topic our uh, event is based on. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Jeff. So Jeff today will talk about um, the myth about uh, the myth of private equity. Um, the stage is yours, Jeff. Thank you, Bo. Before I start, anybody who believes in the tooth fairy, please raise your hand. All right, well, anyone who has raised their hand is a good possible customer for the private equity industry, as we're going to talk about today. So I'll go over my background for a couple of minutes. I don't need to repeat what Bo said. I'm going to talk about what is private equity, some of the myths that surround the industry, the mediocre investment returns. And then why do, the big question really is why do managers still invest in private equity? And then we'll take some questions at the end. So as he said, I've had a variety of positions in the finance area, banker, institutional lender, private equity. Now I'm a university lecturer and I've written several books. Uh, I've done deals all over the world, IPOs, M&A, private equity, United States, South America, Asia, Europe. I've been around to say the least. Exposure to lots of different cultures and investment environments, different companies. So, you know, I've got a bit of an intellectual bent, which you don't see on Wall Street sometimes. So, I mean, that's prompted me to kind of look at things in a different way or an analytical way. And that's kind of what led to the books that Bo mentioned the equity valuation book. The MA book is a book that goes over the merger and acquisition process pretty much from A to Z. And then, you know, for this audience in particular, a book on the emerging markets, which is sort of a guide, uh, since I've been to, to so many emerging markets, a guide to how a company and say, or a bank or private equity firm in Germany or England or the United States might approach investing in South America or Asia. Uh, the last book, is an expose of the World Bank, which also might appeal to the audience since it covers the world's preeminent development institution, if you want to call it that, uh, the World Bank. So before I start about private equity, you know, one of the comparisons that people, when they look at private equity, use is how, how does it perform against the stock market? So it's incumbent upon us to talk about the stock market for a minute or two. And investing in public stocks, and there's many, many mutual funds, professional hedge funds, buying stocks, tens of thousands of people work at these organizations, evaluating, trading stocks, buying and selling. Most of them are pretty smart. You know, they've gone to the London School of Economics or Oxford or Harvard or Wharton and got their MBA degree. So they're all very smart. They have similar trading. So what, what, what's been discovered over the years, it's very difficult for any manager to beat the public stock market consistently. And you know, there are a handful that do it over a long period of time, like 10 years. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's luck in their case or it could be ability, but if you look at, let's say, 
50% of the time you beat it and you do it for 10 years in a row and the chances of doing that are one in a thousand. So, you know, rare, rare manager indeed that can do that. So public fund managers, you know, have trouble beating the public stock indices like in the United States, Standard and Poor's 500 is a popular index. The private equity fund managers have the same issue. They can't consistently beat these indexes. And I guess the probably the positive for the private equity industry, they managed to hide this fact for the last 15 years. And when I talk about private equity, I'm, you know, we're going to talk mainly about leverage buyouts today, but private equity uh, type investment classes like venture capital and developing market private equity have the same issues as well. So what is private equity? You read about, a lot about it, hear a lot about it. What is it? Well, I, like I said, I'm focusing on leverage buyouts. So uh, a private equity fund is a pool of money. And the most of the money is put up are furnished by giant institutional investors like big pension funds, state pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, university endowments. So they, they're trying to beat the stock market. So they're gonna put their money in these big funds. The funds are managed by investment banker types who know how to close deals. They do not really know how to run companies, but they knew how to find companies to buy, how to close the deals, how to value them. and. But sometimes the private equity fund will have operating executives that know how to run a business to help them out. And so when you go into the fund as an investor, it's what's called a blind pool. You don't know what you're buying because the managers haven't run out and looked and bought companies yet. So you're, you're sort of going into what's called on Wall Street, a blind pool. You don't know what's in there yet. The track record of the managers is there, but you still don't know what they're gonna buy. They're usually buying private companies and they're trying to use a high level of debt and a low equity level. So the basic rule of finance 101 is if you put more debt on an asset, if it has a positive return going forward, the additional debt is going to enhance your equity return. So that's finance 101. So if you look at a leverage buyout on this slide, you can see it's got 70% debt, sometimes 80% debt at a leverage buyout, and you know it's only 30% equity. If you flip it to a normal publicly traded company, it, it will have a lot more equity. So the fundamental idea between, behind the leverage buyout is that more debt will enhance the return, assuming everything works out. Now, the private equity fund has got a 10-year life cycle. So that's a, what's called a 10-year no-cut contract, which means the private equity fund manager has a 10 year contract with the investors. The private equity fund manager will get paid whether or not the manager loses money for the investors or makes money. So it's better than any professional athlete contract you're generally gonna see. I mean, not even the best footballer in London is gonna be getting a 10 year no cut contract. And the way that it works over 10 years is fund needs a few years to find deals and close them. So that takes a few years to find 10 or 12 companies to buy. Then they got a few years to try to improve the company, try to get their profits up, get sales higher. And then they got two or three years to sell all the investments and return the money to the institution. So if you look at it sort of a big picture situation, the LBO, fund managers are sort of like the public fund stock pickers and managers there. But instead of picking an investment out of 10,000 publicly traded stocks, they're only looking at a much smaller universe of available M&A deals. And of course, they're buying the entire company. They're buying the entire company. They are on, they're not just buying one or two million shares of buying the entire company. They have some input into how it's run, but essentially they're picking equities. Uh, for their investors. Now, <clears throat> developing countries, which is you know, the focus of this group, there are many, many private equity funds focusing on the emerging markets. They do not, however, follow the LBO model. They do not buy in general the entire company because there just aren't enough M&A deals available in emerging markets 
So they're usually these these emerging market funds are usually buying a 20 or 30 percent equity interest when they close a deal and then they hope to get out of it six seven eight years later this is called growth capital where the private equity fund doesn't really buy the entire business so what are the myths i'm talking about in terms of private equity well let's start off with the basic sales pitch of the private equity leverage buyout industry. If you look on this chart, you'll see a blue line. That's called the security market line. So the fundamental theory of finance investment is if you're going to buy an investment, it should, you know, it's, it's going to fall somewhere along the security line where you will have more risk as you get a higher expected return. So as you can see on this little diagram, a US Treasury bond has a lower expected return than the stock market, but it also has a lot lower risk. Now the private equity industry claim is that they have lower risk than the stock market, yet higher returns. So I'll just point out that this assertion refutes financial theory from the 1950s onward plus academic papers written by three Nobel laureates. Uh, nevertheless, the, this notion persists. Another myth is that these managers are geniuses and they pick all the right companies to buy and then they have some kind of secret sauce that enables them to improve the profits of the companies they're buying and then to sell them at a higher price later on. So, you know, this combination of claims has enabled the PE industry to charge management fees, which are literally 100 times higher than the management fee you'd pay for a passive public index fund. So before I go into the numbers themselves, I don't want to drown you in numbers. I just want to show you this particular slide. If you look at the last 10 years of private equity funds, they haven't even sold half of their deals. Two thirds of their deals remain unsold. If you go back 15 years, half of their deals are unsold. So you have these terrific companies that the private equity industry has bought, yet nobody else wants to buy them. They've had plenty of years to sell and they're not selling. So we'll keep that in fact in mind for a second. So here's the three measurement tools that tell us you know how well a fund is doing the first one is from your first week of corporate finance class where you looked at what the internal rate of return is that's the discount rate where the future cash flows when you bring them back to the present equal the amount of investment so if you're looking for example a typical simple illustration would be a bond yield you see a bond that's yielding five percent that yield is essentially the internal rate of return of the bond that you're thinking of buying. So that's one measurement tool. The other one is Kapler, Kaplan Shoar PME, and that compares the private equity funds performance to the general stock market. And then the last one, which is a little simpler, less mathematics involved, is the total value in the paid in. So you look at the amount of money that the investors put in versus simple ratios to how much they get out. All these ratios rely on the estimates that the private equity fund has made about what the unsold deals are worth. And many of the deals, as I mentioned, are unsold. Let's look at the internal rate of return for a second. So here, you know, this is the latest information available a bit of a delay in private equity reporting. And you can see, you know, for the last year, the buyout business has underperformed the stock market. If you go three back, three, five, and 10, it's basically a wash. So these claims that you hear, oh, they're killing it. They're, they're beating the public markets by leaps and bounds. They're totally false. So this IRR statistic that I'm showing right there, it's open to manipulation. You have to think about that. You know, funds have, have a tendency to sell their profitable deals first, and then they hang on to the losers. If you do the math, you'll see that that will tend to push up 
the internal rate of return statistic. Another trick they use to enhance their results in the IRR is to move their, let's say the fund started in 2008, you push it out to 2009 for the sake of the statistic and it shortens the holding period, boosts the IRR. And then the last one is a credit line. As these funds got bigger and bigger, the managers said, hey, you know, we can borrow money on our own credit. So the trick here is the private equity fund will buy a company on its own credit, its own balance sheet, hold it for a few months, then drop it into the fund. And so just like the, the last point I made, this activity will shorten the holding period of the fund itself and therefore boost the internal rate of return. So the IRR is not the best measurement, I guess. The next one I'm gonna talk about is the Kaplan SCOR tool, which is a, you know interesting num uh, statistic to use. It's got some of the same problems as I mentioned for the IRR, the timing, the shifting of the year, credit lines, and of course the guesstimate. Uh, but it's a useful statistic. You can measure real quickly the performance against the public markets. So, you know, here we're comparing the vintage year of selected LBO funds to the last 15 years, US LBO funds. And we're looking at how well did they beat the public market. So if, if the score is one, that means the fund matched the public market. Any score over one is a, a little better than the public market. So, you know, 1.1, 1.2, when you figure a lot of the companies have not been sold, you're not, as we say in America, you're not hitting the cover off the ball. This is barely beating the market and that's using the fund's own estimates of what the unsold companies are worth. If you think, or you're a little cynical and you think the private equity funds are setting those values while looking at them through rose colored glasses, you know, maybe these numbers drop a little bit. So the TVPI is the third measurement tool. And as I said earlier, it's the value of the unsold investments plus whatever cash has been paid out to the investors from deals that have been sold. So, you know, the example is, is in the last point you have Investors put in a billion dollars over a few years. And let's say at the end of eight or nine years, they've gotten 500 million in cash. And then the fund is supposedly worth with whatever deals it has left, 800, then the TVPI in a very simple ratio is 1.3. So, you know, you, you as an investor have made more than you put in. The problem with this measurement, as I'm sure a lot of you can see, is it doesn't take into effect time value of money. Uh, if you look at the next chart, this would be buyout fund results for the last 15 years. You know, you, you probably got an average of around 1.5, maybe a little bit higher. If you look at the holding period for deals in this sector of private equity, it's about five and a half years. So assuming all the unsold values are correct, you're looking at about an 8% return on a weighted basis, which is not anywhere near what you hear about in the media or even on some of the claims when buyout fund guys get on TV. So interesting fact before uh, we keep going, if you look at a typical LBO fund, even with the greatest fund managers, they have this kind of pattern where they'll have 10 deals, three go bankrupt, four okay, and three would be home runs, so to speak. So it's not like these geniuses are picking winners all the time. You know, you know, out of 10 deals, they might have three solid winners. So, you know, how do you pick funds? Well, you know, they have a random element to the returns, even the big name funds, you know, they have a hard time duplicating past success. There's not a lot of what's called consistency where, you know, a, a fund can duplicate easily its results from a prior fund. So, you know, maybe the best way to pick one is just throwing darts at a dartboard as this photo indicates. So in closing, I want to say the private equity industry, it's a great 
business for the private equity fund managers. They get a 10 year, no cut contract. Most of the fees are guaranteed, even if the fund doesn't do well. But for the managers, it's basically all upside. Now, you know, when I talk about this subject and with friends or maybe in a forum like this, you know, people say, well, Jeff, why do they do it? Why do the investors, these big institutional investors, why do they keep buying into these funds? And you know, I'll go over the four main reasons as I see it, having looked at this business over the years. You know, the number one reason would be the managers of the institutions is job preservation for them. So, you know, if you're running a university endowment or a state pension fund or some big foundation, you could be making two or $3 million a year. And, you know, part of your reason for justifying that high compensation is that, you know, it's so complicated to run a, a university endowment. I have to buy hedge funds. I have to buy private equity funds. I have to buy real estate. I have to buy commodity funds. In addition to public stocks and bonds, you cannot go into your board of directors and say, look, you guys would make a lot more money just by indexing the money and firing all the managers. No one is going to do that. So they try, the managers, it's incumbent upon the managers to make their job sound very complicated and that they're doing better by doing these esoteric complex investments. Uh, I did a couple of papers with a colleague of mine named Ken Yoke here at Johns Hopkins. We looked at both state pension funds in the United States and we also looked at the big foundations and neither group outperformed a passive 60 stocks, 40 bonds index, which is a popular barometer for institutional investment performance. So that's number one. The second reason is all the big institutions, be they state pension funds, or let's say they're university endowments, they have invest outside investment consultants that help them plan. Uh, you know, here's how much we should put in stocks. Here's how much money we should put in bonds. Here's how much money we should put in real estate. So these investment consultants are getting paid millions of dollars to provide this advice. So if they gave advice like, well, just index the whole thing, a 60-40 index, then the board of directors of the funds, going to the investment institution, be it a sovereign wealth fund or whatever, is going to say, well, if we're just supposed to index a 60-40, what do we need an investment consultant for? So again, you have sort of a survival instinct by both the managers and the investment consultants to make things very complicated. The third one, which it might be a little less emphasis, would be the Stockholm Syndrome. And the Stockholm Syndrome, for those of you that haven't heard of it, relates to a bank robbery in Stockholm some 30 years ago. And the bank robbers took a number of the customers of the bank hostage for several days. And after the robbers were finally arrested, the bank customers did not want to testify against the robbers in court because over the days they started to sympathize with the bank robbers and thought the bank robbers were nice guys and, and needed you know, mercy, so to speak. And it's the same way in the investment world as I see it. The managers of these big institutions, you know, they go to seminars with private equity people. They have lunch with them. They read all their reports. And after a while, if you're exposed to it enough and you don't listen to someone like myself, you know, you're just gonna believe that what they say is true. And then the fourth group would be what I call the true believers. And, you know, even though maybe they've read some papers that say, you know, private equity or sophisticated investments don't beat an index, they think I it doesn't matter what those statistics say, I can pick the best private equity fund. They will beat the market. I can beat everybody else. So that's what I call a true believer. So in closing, I'll just say private equity underperforms the public markets. A lot of institutions ignore this fact. So you might say to me, well, Jeff, who cares? What's the big deal? So what? So maybe 20, 30, 40 billion a year in fees goes out of these institutions. Well, that's money that the beneficiaries of the institutions are not getting. They're losing income. So for a state pension fund, say here in the United States, that would be 
the pensioners may get their benefits cut or not increased as much as they are, they should have. For if you're looking at a nonprofit foundation which is underperforming, you know the poor people that benefit from the foundation may not be getting the same benefits. And same with universities, if the endowment's not doing all that well or underperforming relative to a big index. That means students might be getting less tuition scholarships or something. So on that note, I'll be happy to take any questions. I'll see if I can get the slide off the screen here. Yeah, good. Okay, so I'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, if the moderator wants to pick somebody. Thanks, Jeff. It's very insightful. So. Um... So if anyone has any question, you, you can maybe raise your hand or uh, type your question in the chat, then I will invite you to speak when it's your turn. Yeah. In case there's a, like um, uh, several people who wants to ask questions. Yeah. So I think, um, so Nicholas, uh, Nicholas has a question. Do you want to mute yourself? Uh, mute yourself and ask a question or yeah, so Nick, Nicholas asks, would you not recommend a student to want to go into PE? Uh, no, quite the opposite. I think, I think first, a lot of students here where I, where I work at Johns Hopkins want to go into PE. I, I think PE is a good business. As I said, if you can get into it, it's a 10-year, no-cut contracts. There's a lot of job security. The business is very similar to investment banking, so it's, you know, well, you got a lot of dynamic individuals. I think it's pretty interesting. The fact that it underperforms the public markets is not a well understood fact. And uh, I don't think that fact is going to come out for years and years. By the time you know it becomes widely acknowledged, I'll be sitting down in Florida underneath the beach umbrella. I think it's a good, I think it's a good position for a young person. muted yeah yeah so um zen has a question zen do you want to ask the question yeah hi jeff thank you for that presentation it was um it was quite refreshing to see actually um i'm i'm currently uh, a first year analyst at the lazard uh, in london um you know and, and i've been you know nowadays it seems like all you know, the young investment bank analysts are always looking to, to go to PE. So I have a number of friends, you know, who are speaking about this, uh, the transition, everything. And we, you know, this is something that we've talked about. And um, one thing which I wanted to ask you about is the hedge fund industry, actually, because that's, uh, you know, the hedge fund industry has got a lot of stick for, you know, not beating the public market. And one question which we had is, you know, you know, why are the LPs, you know, the LPs are going to, they're not completely, uh, you know, they know that the hedge funds uh, don't beat the public markets always. So why don't they just do, you know, put all their money in the S&P 500? And I think uh, your answer alluded to it, but um, what do you think, do the same problems exist uh, in the hedge fund industry that managers by the fact of their position, uh, they need to do something extra uh, to justify their high salaries. Do you think that same problem exists in the hedge fund industry as well? Yeah, look, I've studied the hedge fund industry as well for a big a state pension fund that had a diversified portfolio of like 100 hedge funds. And, you know, we looked at the hedge fund performance over a few years. And, and the, you know, hedge funds, of course, most of, a lot of them are long short, some of them are long only, others are doing a lot of fixed income. So hedge funds are a little more complicated than PE because they have such a broad array of investment opportunities. But your average hedge fund collection will not be a 60-40. So you might say, okay, same question. Why do, why do people invest in hedge funds? Why the, the LPs, if, like I said earlier, it's the same situation if you're an LP and you're making a couple million dollars a year running some university endowment 
you're not going to go into the board and say, look, we can sell all our hedge funds and all our PE funds and make more money doing it 60, 40. You've just killed your career. There's no reason why you should do it. A lot of these people have wives, they have families, they have mortgages. They're not going to walk in and be a saint and tell the board of directors what's really going on. Now, the only justification, as I can see, for, say, maybe the private equity investment by institution, you do get a small amount of diversification because you're buying into companies that are not publicly traded. But the diversification benefit is so small relative to the fees that then I don't think it's worth it. But anyway, getting back to the big picture for young guys that working at Lazard or similar institutions, I mean, you know, these these hedge funds and these PE funds control, you know, several trillion dollars in assets. I don't think they're going to go away, you know, because there are a few naysayers. You know, there's just too much incentive for the managers of the LPs to keep the complexity going, even if the institutions are losing money as a result. What's next, Bo? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, there's uh, lots of questions. Maybe let's uh, let's uh, let uh, the one who raised the hands to ask question first. So, uh, Ali, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for a great presentation. So, I wanted to ask basically. So, Edward J. Matthias of the Carla Group basically said in a in in a lecture he gave awards in in 2010 or something. He talked about how emerging market private equity funds are outperforming uh, uh, private equity funds in Europe and North America. So is there potentially a case of uh, pension funds and uh, state funds not putting, not investing in the right private, private equity assets as, you know, private equities become such a wide scale business with different uh, industry funds and different uh, geographic region uh, funds. So is it, potentially also a case of pension funds simply choosing the same KKR, Carlyle, Apollo, Bain Capital funds, rather than looking at mid markets or funds operating in um, emerging markets. Okay, let me start with the emerging market fund question first. There's no statistical evidence that emerging market private equity funds outperform the emerging market public stock indexes or the conventional FTSE or S&P 500 indexes. No statistical evidence whatsoever. So I, I wouldn't subscribe to that just because someone told you that. Uh, if you ever find that, let me know. But if you can check the Emerging Market Private Equity Association website, there is no such paper. I, uh, the other question is, well, can an institution pick the right private equity fund that outperforms the stock market. And maybe out of 100 private equity funds, maybe 25 will do that in any given vintage year. The problem, Alim, as, as you may have suspected from what I said, is that the if you're looking at KKR Fund 4, for example, and then you say KKR Fund 4 had a pretty good performance, and then you buy into KKR 5. Uh, there's no pattern of consistency. It's very difficult for KKR 5 to replicate KKR 4. And so as an institution, you don't know how to select funds. The historical precedent does not work. You can pick the big name funds like Goldman or Carlisle, and they don't do any better than the small no-name funds, if you look at evidence. So it's like you saw on that one slide, you might as well throw a dart at, you know, a hundred names on a dartboard, and you're going to get the same performance. Oh, next question. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Abin? Abin, are you here? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question for you is, um, especially the small PE fund managers, they opt for the strategy where uh, they don't really focus on EBITDA multiple expansion. They focus on operational improvements and uh, and generating cash flow and and you know paying down the debt uh, and generating a return uh, from that strategy. 
Could you speak to the flaws of that specific strategy and what you think, uh, uh, think uh, the pros and cons of that is? Well, I think, it, look, Evan, I think it's a good strategy. It's just very tough to pull it off consistently. That's all. I mean, you know, the bigger funds try to do that as well. Yeah, I agree with you, the smaller funds might place more of an emphasis on that strategy. It's difficult to pull off. They cannot do it consistently. And if you look at the returns on these small funds, they're about the same as the big ones over, you know, 10, 15 year period. So the, what, what I'm trying to say, there is, there seems to be no secret sauce or magic formula. They all, you know, aggregated, they all kind of do about the same. Now, you know, uh, Alan had said earlier, well, some of the funds, you know, they're trying to specialize in you know, one industry, or they're trying to specialize in a certain size deal. Yeah, I mean, those are good techniques. I think maybe you got more expertise, but they don't seem to provide any extra return. So you got the same problem as we talked about very early in my presentation of uh, there doesn't seem to be even the public stock managers can't get it to work. Thanks, Jeff. Next, Josh. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for the presentation. As someone who's taking your project finance course right now, I just wondered what you would think a good entry level job that could eventually lead to a career in real estate, private equity be. You know, great, a great job would be in a publicly traded real estate investment trust, which is a popular public market investment in real estates of various kinds. We have hundreds of those kinds of publicly traded trusts in the United States. And I guess, you know, a good backup to something like that would be a private equity real estate fund. And there's hundreds of those. And then maybe, you know, maybe some developers. So there's, those are three basic avenues, Josh. Bo, next one. Next one, Malika. Hi, um, I'm Malika. First of all, thank you so much for the insightful talk. Um, so I currently study international development at King's College, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on some of the macroeconomic impacts of private equity as an industry, and also its impact on developing the emerging economies, especially with some of your work in the World Bank and as um, part of the economic development think tank. Well, from a macroeconomic point of view in the emerging markets, I just think the industry right now, you know, for those large number of countries that are emerging market, I just think the impact is pretty small. There's just not enough money in all those funds on a collective basis to make much of an impact. In the United States and say uh, some of the more advanced economies, private equity has gotten pretty big. You know, it's employs millions of people, you know, controls some pretty big companies. So, I mean, they've definitely had some impact. They also, uh, you know, I think they've had some impact on the way public companies look at the way they should manage their business because they may be, they're afraid of, you know, some of the managers are afraid of getting taken over. So there, there's definitely been some spillovers. And then there, there's a lot of publicity, which is, you know, perhaps unwarranted in certain cases of how, you know, the private equity guys come in and fire everybody. And that's been the case in the newspaper industry in the United States, and maybe a few others. I think the impact's a little exaggerated. Um, but there, you know, there, there's also some benefits. They, they do sometimes impose a little more discipline on bloated companies. They also give the family owned business out. You know, a lot of these, you know, sort of medium sized, low tech family owned businesses, they had nowhere to go if the parents got old and the kids didn't want to work in the business. It'd be hard for them to sell. But now the private equity industry is giving them an avenue to get out. So I'd say, you know, the macro indications are kind of small in terms of effect, but, you know, they definitely get noticed. Thanks, Jeff. Next, uh, Aryan. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for the talk. 
So the question I had was, so the reason, the more like the more academic reason for not being able to beat public market is given that public markets are way too efficient. There are too many investors involved and almost all the information is publicly available. So public markets are kind of efficient, which is why nobody is able to beat them in the long run. However, private markets, simply because they are private, there's less information available. There were more imperfections within those private markets, which then fund managers could exploit. So do you feel that with the increased competition and like returns decreasing in the private market, it just means that the private market is also becoming more efficient, right? Like there's more information available and funds like the returns which were expected for a company are being realized. And that's sort of good for social welfare once you look at it from like a holistic view of society in general. Well, first I'd say that's a hundred percent right. If you were taking a PE course, you'd have to get an A plus. Yeah, so I mean, back since say 15 years ago or 90s, early 2000s, there was less competition in the private equity market. So they were the 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 buyers in private they were not pushing up the prices of the companies. So I wouldn't say it was you know easy to get big returns, but with less competitions, the prices weren't as high. And I think they were getting more leverage back then. You know, now you're 70% is sometimes a high watermark. Back then you get 80 or 85%. So once they had a lot of success in the United States and Europe, which was, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they were really doing well. Then you got a lot more players involved. Prices go up. A lot of the funds grew up in size. So it's, I think it's really hurt returns uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. And I guess, you know, to sum up what you said, yes, it's gotten more of an efficient market, which has damaged returns. And, you know, whether the finance industry will move on to something else like a SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Corps, <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see. Thanks, Jeff. Next, uh, Alim. Alim, are you uh, there? Yeah, thanks once again. Yeah, yeah I'm here. here. Um, so I have a question about, so basically back in 2016, when Mitch Romney and Obama were going head to head for the president's election, there was this notion about private equity destroying that you'd had being, ex you had, you'd, you'd have being executives come Spelling this notion and talking about how they've taken companies, made them more efficient, and created value in the economy. So, do you believe, you know, despite them not maybe turning over much return, do private equity firms uh, create generate value, or is it a notion which is simply not true? I don't think they. Yeah, you know, for the most part, I don't think they create any extra value. I mean, the the academic research on this is somewhat mixed. You know, some people have come to the conclusion that private equity firms enhance the operating margins by making the managers more attentive to expenses and, and looking at other operating efficiencies. Others have looked at the same, you know, same set of statistics or different set of statistics and come to the opposite conclusion. So I, I just think that scientifically that's a hard notion to prove even though that's one of the big selling points i mean i don't care what the selling point is i just look at the results and so the returns to the investor at least are not higher than the stock market now the private equity fund managers are extracting two and a half to three percent per year in fees for not beating the public markets, which is quite remarkable. Now, let's say they gave the LPs or the limited partners, the institutional desk, let's say that they were tougher negotiators and they cut the fees in half, then I think many of these funds would probably beat the stock market, not by much, but slightly. And they might have a better justification for existence, but clearly, you know, a better fee structure would would probably be best since it's very tough to prove the basic thesis of your question, which is that they can improve the companies. Thanks, Jeff. Um, next, Amelia. 
Do you have Do you have a question? Thing you Do you want to ask your question? Amelia, are you here? Uh, yes. You... Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you've listed various reasons why private equity isn't as effective as the stock market and why it has been successful in deceiving people to sort of ignore these reasons. So I suppose my question would be is, with the increasing access to information and growing interest in investment that we can see online, um, do you see private equity as potentially becoming obsolete or maybe the format changing drastically? So my question is honestly about the future and what would your take be? Amelia, thank you. I'm glad you could attend. First, because of the private nature of the business, it's going to be very hard for outside observers to get these statistics and put them all together. It's very complicated to get the statistics, interpret them, put them together, and then inform people that it's not working. Uh, I do think that, I think it'll probably take another decade at least for the LPs to sort of wake up or for their board of directors to sort of wake up and say, guess what? You know, these private equity deals are not really working out for us. We could have done better in the stock market. So I think that's at least 10 years away. Uh, and, you know, the good thing about Wall Street or the city is that it's they're very innovative. So, when the bloom comes off the rose of the leverage buyout business, there will be a substitute. Do I know what it is? No, I don't. Maybe it's some derivation of a hedge fund, some special, you know, some special avenue for private equity. Some other strategy will certainly come to the fore. I mean, Wall Street's great at putting old wine into a new bottle, and I would expect that certainly to happen the next 10 years or so when what I'm talking about becomes, you know, a little more obvious. I don't think it's going to become widely accepted, but I think some investors will eventually take note of it. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Zen, you have another question. Zen, Hi, Jeff. Are you uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Bo. Um, so it's actually following on from Amelia's question, and thank you for that question, Amelia. Um, my question is, uh, on, in, a, in a similar vein, it seems like in the last 30 years, if you look at the trend and the limited reading that I've done is, uh, and the, 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 the data that I've seen is that generally valuations have crept up over the last 30 years in the private markets, as particularly for the private, for leverage buyouts, um, for leverage buyouts in general. So that's obviously putting a pressure on returns. So you've seen returns also uh, go down over the last 30 years. Um, and that's you know broadly backed up from some of the data that you, you showed already. Um, so, and there's been a lot more players in the private equity industry and there's a lot more money being raised by these um, you know, leverage buyout funds, such to the extent that you've got almost $2.5 trillion of dry, $2.5 trillion of dry powder sitting there ready to be deployed. So wow, people, yeah, so people have understood and they've, I think generally now it's not like something novel. People understand, you know, how to financially engineer a company and do a leverage buyout, right? Um, yeah. So the, the, the question that I had is that, is for example, venture capital gonna be the next private equity in the next 30 years? I.e., you know, it seems like that space hasn't been, you know, exploited as much. It's starting to, you know, gain a lot more traction. Um, do you think venture capital is the next private equity? Venture capital is going to be more cyclical than the buyout business. You know, it's 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 not a hundred percent high tech. A lot of people say, oh, the venture capital is all high tech. It's not. There's a lot of normal, but normal or old fashioned companies to get financed through venture capital. I just don't think, you know, in the startup uh, world, there's enough deals to absorb the kind of capital you see in the leverage buyout business. There's just not enough 
good deal. So I don't think venture capital is going to surpass uh, the leverage buyout business. I mean, you might see a little more emphasis on uh, growth capital. And I think maybe in the SPAC area, you could, you know, this might be looking five years down the road. People say, well, I like the low tech, non-cyclical orientation of leverage buyouts. I do not want to pay all the fees. And maybe some of these low tech uh, companies that you know might go uh, LBO might maybe they go public through the SPAC and therefore offer uh, offer LPs you know the public option of buying a somewhat similar business. So let's take one more question, and I think we should call it a day, Bo. And Jeff, just one, just kind of just a quick follow up on that. Um, where can where can we find some of your papers and and your research? Well, I think you just got to. You can Google Jeff Hook, and you know the papers are pretty much available uh, for purview. At least the abstracts are in the Journal of Private Equity, the Journal of Alternative Investments, the Chronicle of Higher Education. And there's just some of the papers. But look at me, Google me, or my colleague Ken Yook, Ken uh, Yook Y O O K, and you'll be able to find you know five or six papers that kind of relate to this subject matter. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, let's uh, take maybe the last question. I think, yeah. Anyone? If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Anyone? No one? So I, I, I can see there's uh, several questions on the chat box, maybe. Well, Let me just- take, Yeah, let's take one more question, but off the chat board then. Yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe like what, what impact has the pandemic has on private equity, if any? You know, when I, it's a uh, bit general. Yeah. Good question. You know, good question to end it. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, when I first saw the pandemic coming, I thought it'd be the end of the world for private equity and the M and A business. And that shows you what I know. I mean, the M and A business has been very strong, and so has private equity. So, contrary to what we all thought a year ago, the impact has been minimal. And you know, I know that from talking to my colleagues in the investment banking business, I mean, deals are getting done. A lot of the due diligence is all being done online. The management presentations are being done on, on Zoom. And, you know, there's not a lot of physical contact and not a lot of traveling, but deals are still getting done. So pandemic impact minimal. Once everybody gets vaccinated, I expect, you know, the volume to climb up uh, accordingly. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks very much. It's Thanks it's very everybody. insightful. Thanks for your presentation and your like your like answers of to all the questions. It's quite insightful. Real, yeah. And real uh, pleasure, Bo. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Mitu, do you want to say something? Or yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was our final event. Uh, super insightful. So thank you very much, Jeff. And thanks both for moderating. Thanks to everyone in the audience for coming. As for a recording, we're gonna put it up on our YouTube channel, hopefully in the next in the next week or so, and you can see the link in the chat. Um, Jeff, would you be happy with us distributing the slides as well? Yeah, no problem. Excellent. So um, I guess you could email us on our uh, on our society email address or message us on our socials and we'll reach out to you with the slides. Great. Perfect. Um, and that concludes our events for this year. Everyone else have a lovely rest of your day or evening. Take care. Bye.